<laughs> okay. Penny Inn and how it got that way. That the title, by the way, is um, I, I stole it from myself. I have a website by the same name, which is I hope it's got my gear enough to explore. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> There's um, always the first time. <laughs> There's always the first time. It's right. Um, now I can't either remember what I was talking about. Oh yes, my website. And um, and I like you know I'm not I'm not actually not very good at titles. So having you know found one that I like, I just I kept it <laughs> and used it for this book. Um, and it, it's actually a, quite an accurate title because uh, for kind of two strands of thought. Uh, first of all, um, it is, uh, it doesn't, it's not strictly speaking a history of Peng Yan. It's a, a look at how uh, the Peng Yan we all know and love today uh, got that way. Uh, that is to say, there are a lot of influences that obviously arise from the, the people who lived here, uh, but, it, and, but also uh, there's a tremendous amount of influence uh, from the outside world. So it's essentially, or at least in many, in many basic respects, it is a history of the world as seen from Penn Yan. Um, has anybody read it already? Oh, good. Oh, well. <laughs> Not too many. And then, you know, I knew that. <laughs> I knew they read it. My, my uh, Sue Lang, who was taking the money tonight, has read it on a number of occasions because she was my very loyal and hard working proofreader. And um, uh, when, you, when you write something of that, size and intensity, you get so you literally can't see it anymore. <laughs> so I had to have um, proofreaders, and I happened to have some really, really good ones, and it was one of them. It just, uh, I, I, after many, many years of proofreading myself, which is very unsatisfying, uh, it's uh, it's just wonderful to have somebody who always sees the extra spaces and the commas in the wrong place and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not at all an expert typist, and I can remember retyping and retyping and typing once again with carbons. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's. It's, uh, you know, the whole computer revolution is, is, is a gift to writers, but you still have to print it out and look at it, not on the screen, and it's so much nicer if you have some friends that will help you out on that eddy. So, thank you. Again, I have thank, thanked her and my other proofreader, uh, Newton, I mean, just like hundreds of times, but I, I mean it, and here's another one. Okay. The other way in which uh, Penn Yan got that way, or the other, in the, the other respect in which I use the phrase, uh, is like I, I think Penn Yan is not unique in, in this, uh, but I haven't lived in a lot of small towns, so I'm not sure. But it seems so ad lib. <laughs> Um, in the sense of, uh, you know, there's no deterministic uh, influence at all. It just, you know, somebody comes in and builds a cabin in the middle of the woods, and somebody else shows up, and then maybe somebody else, and then their in-laws, you know, built a cabin next door, and, and that sort of thing. It just, like, it just happens. It isn't planned by anybody. And a, a place like Penn Yan, which was uh, actually founded quite early for Western New York, you know, you can tell by looking at a map, the streets are <coughs> angles, um, and 
they go off in little funny directions, and there's places where you think there ought to be a street, but isn't, and, and just because you know, some, nobody thought of it in time, and it was all bought up by people, and they built their houses, and nobody was going to build a street, you know, through their front rooms. Uh, that is literally what happened at Clinton Street, um, which ought to have. Um, it, it wasn't laid out until 1835, which is actually pretty late, and and it should be across street from. Chapel Street it should go go straight through, uh, but it doesn't, and everybody knows. And <laughs> and that was because by the, by 1835, when it was laid out, uh, there was a great where the where St. Mark's is now. There was this great big five story, uh, which included basements. By the way, it wasn't five stories from the ground up. It was two, I think three and then two basements. But anyway, a five story chair factory with uh, other small manufacturers renting out space in it and you know he didn't he, he refused to move it and and um, <laughs> not unnaturally and um, and uh, so they had couldn't they couldn't just build a, a cross street they had to put a street they did put a street in there but it was it was um, uh, added it's got that little dog leg, and that's why. <laughs> um, and I, it also, um, I remember reading in the minutes of the Village Board, which are, you know, they really ought to be published, edited and published and annotated because they are really and truly hilarious. <laughs> um, I kept thinking as I was reading them that, uh, you know, um, they, they, all these funny little things that were forbidden by law. And you think to yourself, well, they wouldn't pass a law forbidding it if people weren't doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you find yourself trying to imagine, you know, the, the, the parking problem when it was a horse and wagon, which is, you know, quite a long object and you weren't supposed to park it all the way across Main Street, um, which you know, brought everything to a halt because Main Street, until 1824, was essentially the only street in town. It was the only one that ran north and south anyways. And, um, and, uh, and then a little later on, when, when uh, it became, uh, you know, everybody wanted to be sort of, sort of grown up and genteel, um, all the regulations having to do with the dumping of garbage. <laughs> you can't, you can't, sorry, you can't throw it out on the sidewalk. You can't, uh, you know, you can't just toss it off, uh, awful, you know, uh, the, the insides of animals onto the street. You have to, you know, <laughs> take care of it in a, in a better way than that. Um, you weren't allowed to um, sell uh, uh, meat from from a wagon uh, in certain places in the, in the village. Um, I mean, they're just numerous, uh, small. Like you couldn't, you know, put up little booths and shops of uh, portable portable businesses, let's call them, along Main Street. Now the other streets maybe were choked with them, but Main Street, Main Street was was very wide, like a lot of Main Streets in small towns, and um, apparently there was this tide of people flowing back and forth who wanted to bring it, bring in their wagons from the country and sell off the back of them, and who wanted to put up little little uh, temporary, you know, tents and and uh, and booths and and. Uh, you know, like all laws, there's about 15 uh, synonyms that you couldn't put up there. And um, again, you know, why bother passing a law? It was obvious that this is, you know, people were literally blocking Main Street with all these things. Uh, you weren't allowed to let your pigs run loose. Um, you weren't allowed to let uh, your stallions uh, run loose. 
And in fact, <laughs> a little later on, um, uh, stud horses were, you, you could have one, but you had to have it in a barn or a stable or something. You weren't allowed to go to the fairgrounds and uh, set up shop there for people to bring their mares in to be covered. <laughs> and and uh, you, were, you weren't allowed to swim in the outlet in the daytime. Uh, because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for obvious reasons, which you know, but it's a, it's kind of a cultural twist here because, of course, the people who were swimming in the daytime were boys, and um, and of course they swam naked, and you know you could you you couldn't offend the ladies <laughs> by being out there in your skin, you know, jumping into the outlet. Uh, which apparently, you know, was was popular enough that they had to pass a law against it. <laughs> this was another huge controversy about whether or not the village ought to allow, um, or to change its laws to allow um, uh, playing of baseball on Sunday. Um, it was uh, an occasion of sin playing playing baseball because, of course, it was uh, it was ga a gambling opportunity basically, and because it was uh, indulged in almost exclusively by the Irish immigrants who would come in and their children, and uh, in the period in question, which was right around the turn of the century, and of the 20th century, and. Um, and I, you know, they had a reputation for drunken brawls. Now, whether whether this was whether this was a, a true stereotype or not, I don't know. Obviously, because I wasn't here. But to hear the newspapers tell it, it was it was uh, noisy and offensive and probably stinky and and uh, just you know, it just wasn't the sort of thing you wanted in your village on Sundays. And um, they prevented it for a long time. Uh, in the 1920s, it really came to a head. They allowed it. Um, why, I don't know, but they did, in fact, a lot. Because, of course, nobody on the village board was, was Irish. <laughs> the Irish were all Democrats. <laughs> and <laughs> the village board, though it's a nonpartisan election, uh, they were all Republicans, and um, hence dry, <laughs> and hence um, uh, uh, anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, and you know it, it's just one of the <coughs> facts of life in in the early 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century, that the Democrats, the, the Democratic Irish, who had their own newspaper, by the way. Um, because the Republican paper never took any notice of them, so they had to have their own newspaper. <laughs> but uh, Gates County and Penyan, uh, countywide, uh, ever since the Republican Party was founded in 1856, uh, has never, ever, uh, uh, the Republicans have never lost an election. In, in, in the county. The, the last Democratic president um, uh, who, carried, who carried Yates County um, was uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson in 1964. The previous last Democrat who carried the uh, county was Martin Van Buren. <laughs> I mean, even John Fremont, who was the first Republican candidate, presidential candidate, uh, right after the party was founded, uh, he ran in 1856 against James Buchanan, and and of course nationwide he was crushed. He was a yeah, would have been a terrible president, but he carried Gates County. <laughs> it, it, it was uh, it, it's kind of a fascinating thing to to watch um, in terms of political history generally.
to see how how the big picture uh, plays out in a small forum. And that's what I, I, I try very hard to represent in this book. I tried also very hard to use to use primary sources and to actually have facts in, in the book. Um, research of that type takes forever. It took me about three years to, re to write, and, it, and as I said earlier, it, I had to stop because I could have read yet more newspapers. <laughs> I could have uh, read uh, yet more minute books. Um, I really enjoyed them. I, 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 I know it sounds funny, but it was uh, I, many happy hours were spent reading those minutes. Um, and they really ought to be indexed so anybody can go and find the little juicy parts. But um, I, I just can't do that this week. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm the village historian as well, you know, and, and, and the, um, uh, the impetus for the book, in, in many ways, was the website that I, that I uh, maintain um, about Penny Ann. Actually, it's about Main Street, essentially, because I haven't gotten off Main Street yet. And in fact, I haven't even gotten to, to the whole street. I've got about two-thirds of the street on that website, and some year I will, you know, get all the way down to the bridge. But um, uh, I, I have always had a very, um, and this is probably a good thing for an historian, um, uh, a great respect for uh, the truth, <laughs> for reality, the real world. And in fact, the real world, that is to say the, the big world, uh, uh, has, has an enormous impact. Um, even presidential elections and, you know, overseas wars and, and uh, inventions uh, and, and those kinds of things that we all learned in grammar school, you know, and high school probably too. Um, I think they still require American history. They did when I did a thousand years ago when I was in high school. And those, you know, those are the big facts that you learn, or that you, you used to learn anyway. And and it's of course there was never any any connection drawn then about how these sorts of things, you know, the the classic dead presidents. How did this how did this affect, you know, our little Munchkin lives? And those are the connections that I was primarily interested in when I wrote this book. Now, God knows that the Penyanners themselves uh, did just fine, <laughs> raising hell all by themselves without any assistance from anybody else. Um, but. Uh, you know, we all knew that already. <laughs> so, so I uh, and I. There's plenty of that stuff in the um, in the book. But um, you'll notice. I mean, you can't help but notice that uh, uh, a lot of the emphasis in the text is on how did it happen? How did how, what forces? You know squeezed um, the, the village and its people into whatever form they took at any one particular time. Uh, it's like squeezing an ice cube, you know. It'll, it'll eventually, your pliers will eventually sink right into it and turn it into a different shape. And that is, I, that's sort of an analogy to what happens to a, to a settlement as it grows and as it matures, and as it falls on hard times, and as it comes out of hard times um, quite differently than when it went into them. Um, you, 
you just can't ignore um, the, what I suppose we could call big history when you're doing local history. And uh, I'm afraid that a lot of local history, when it's written, is written as though um, whatever town or village or city is, it, it's focused on is on a separate planet from the rest of the universe. And, um, and you know, there isn't any place on Earth that's a se on a separate planet, let's face it. By definition, yes, but also in reality. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds so convivial, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> So, in 1791, um, the family of George Wheeler, including his, his, uh, all his friends and relations, including his sons-in-law, and we're married, we're married to his daughters, obviously, of which he had many. Uh, he, he had many friends and relations. <laughs> and, um, he owned, and how he acquired all this land isn't exactly understood, um, but he owned a, a pretty good percentage of the town, what is now the town of Benton. But he also owned a lot, and when I say a lot, we're talking about 270 acres. They were what is now, what the surveyors call them, great lots. So let's think of it as a house and lot. Okay, these are they were they were meant to be farms, farm sized, but of course in, in 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 those days in the 1790s nobody had a 270 acre farm. Uh, they may have had a 270 acre or 265 acre woodlot <laughs> and a little patch of corn someplace. And, and um, George Wheeler, who um, was the, the father of this of his numerous clan. Um, uh, came into actually, unlike a lot of his fellow large landowners, actually came and lived on the land that he bought. An awful lot of them um, were, I guess, what uh, were what you would call spec land speculators. Uh, the land in Milo, in a very complicated transaction, which I am not going to go into here, so don't worry. Um, fell into the hands of a land company out of uh, Columbia County, New York, which is on the other side of the Hudson River, way over by Massachusetts. And um, they um, had some very shady dealings with, with Senecas and with the, um, and some really shady. Uh, transactions with a group of English English slash Tory slash Canadian uh, interests and uh, were basically dealing in all this land and so they came into possession of four townships in Phelps and Gorham's purchase Phelps and Gorham, of course, is, that all has to do with the Massachusetts preemption and all that stuff, which I also will not go into today. If you're interested, read my book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's kind of fascinating, and um, uh, but it, it is complicated. I keep find I keep you know my subject matter heretofore has involved all that stuff it, because it had a big effect on how Gates County was settled. And um, every time I get into it, I, my mind blows, you know, and, and I think I'm explaining it, but I'm never really sure. And um, so, you know, after I've gone through it, you know, two or three, four times now, I, I, um, I'm getting so I, I think I understand what was going on. <laughs> but in any case, uh, George Wheeler bought uh, a lot. Not only did he have all this land in Benton, but he bought a, a great lot called Lot 37 in what is today the town of Milo. And that uh, 270 acres is basically is the heart of what is today Penny Ann. And his, one of his sons-in-law, 
named Robert Chisholm um, uh, was given uh, given some of this land and in Lot 37, and he built a house on the site. This was a double log cabin, actually, on the site of what is now um, what is called usually called the Eggers House, 600. Uh, Marie Street, it's right across, on the corner, right across from the hospital, on the other side of Liberty Street. And he, um, it, he obviously, he built his house on a road. There was the only road that went through what is now Penny Inn at the time. And it was usually, it usually seems to have been called the Cannon Dayward Road. Um, it turned, it's what is now North Avenue, essentially. Um, it came all the way across the county from the, the area, oh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't know what it was. Uh, the area, the uh, vicinity of Dresden, uh, and uh, came, came all more or less due west away from another county <laughs> uh, Through what is now Penny Ann, and then up the hill, up Widow Hill, um, which is basically where uh, Route 364, old Route 364, went up the hill instead of kind of gradually up the hill like it does now. And you could, in fact, get, er, eventually get to get to Canandaigua on the Canandaigua Road, but it didn't go straight, more or less straight like 364 does. I mean, it went, it went up the hill. And then it came way down south towards uh, um, Coopton, and then took a big swipe back up north. And like I say, it would, it would have been a week or three weeks. You know, I mean, <laughs> nobody liked to go to Canada anyway, which was the county seat. But if they took that that route, you know, they they would have disappeared from the face of the earth <laughs> to emerge maybe in the spring, you know, I still travel. Uh, I, you know, I always, everybody didn't know on horse even, okay? So an awful lot of those trips were taken on foot. And um, the, the roads were, you know, either, I mean, essentially you couldn't travel on them with a vehicle and, and except in the wintertime, because they were so deep, the mud was so deep, and you get stuck, and how would be that? So everybody waited until winter to do their big traveling. You know, if they had to go to uh, Whitestown or Utica to to get stuff, that was the the closest real place in the 1790s to get uh, supplies, and. Uh, a little bit later on, you could go to Geneva, or you could go, you know, to uh, Canandaigua, which must have seemed like the far side of the moon, or its equivalent. And um, if you had any legal business to do, that's where you had to go uh, until 1823, which was more than 30 years later. So it was um, Yates County was, or what became Yates County. Uh, they're very, very isolated. And so anyway, um, because of that and for other reasons, the first thing Robert Chisholm did, besides uh, getting his numerous family into this double log cabin, um, when I say a double log cabin, there's no good northern word for it. In the south they call them dog trots. Um, it's, a, it's two frames. Okay, two squares with a, I guess you'd call it a breezeway in between with the roof over the whole roof. And um, so meals were taken in the middle. And uh, if you've ever seen an old log cabin, you will know that they're about this big. And if you're a family with nine children, which the Chisholm's were, you didn't spend really an awful lot of time in the actual house. It was just too small. And uh, so, you know, you'd go in there at night because it was safe. One of Robert Chisholm's daughters um, uh, 
Catherine, her name was, and she was the first white child born in the in what is now the village limits of Penny Inn in 1793. She could remember <coughs> Uh, because they had no glass in their windows, uh, they but they had but it's greased paper, which is kind of translucent, and um, so that was in the in the holes in the walls, uh, and um, of which there were probably like two maybe, and um, she could remember hearing as a little girl hearing something snuffling around. Uh, the other side of that greased paper, of course, they couldn't see out. So the next morning, they went out and around, and there was, it was the, had been a very large wolf checking out the, you know, the, the very crowded <laughs> inside of that cabin. It had, she said, it had, you know, really, it's a paw, the paw prints on the windowsill. Um, and uh, so uh, there were also bears, and then mountain lions, and um, you know they really were out in the woods. Uh, it was uh, a very it was not only a hazardous life for the humans, <laughs> uh, and not just for wild animals, for like everything because there was uh, any little chance mishap could cost you your life. And uh, you did have the wild animals, which were mainly a threat to your livestock. The bears apparently really love pork. <laughs> and because every single one of those people had a story, a great story about a bear that stole their pig. And, and the, the one I the best pen and bear and pig story. comes from this, this very early period. Uh, it was a family named Lennox, Robert Lennox. I have no idea what his wife's name is uh, because he never sold any land or you know, he appeared on, on records except on the census of 1800 as Robert Lennox. And only, uh, the early census is only containing the name of the head of the household. Everybody else is a little mark in an age group. <laughs> and um, so he lived apparently in a little log cabin down by Jacob's Brook, uh, about behind about where the community bank is now. And um, they had a pig, and it was in a, a very like everybody. They had a small pen that the pig lived in at night, and um, built of you know heavy timbers. And, uh, but the bear apparently <laughs> um, didn't care about the heavy timbers, <laughs> you know. Uh, and he, uh, he breached the defenses and, and started taking off with his pig. Well, you know, this is like the family's food for the next, you know, when, once it was slaughtered, they put up a lot of it and so on, all of the meat and so on. So it was their winter's diet, basically. And uh, so uh, they ran out of the house, and Mr. Lennox, Robert Lennox, got up on the roof of his cabin because <laughs> he was afraid of the bear. But Mrs. Lennox attacked it with a frying pan <laughs> and, <laughs> awesome. and, and go. Beat, him, beat the bear so hard with that frying pan that she broke it. Oh, All she had in her hand was a handle, which apparently, um, but apparently her assault did the trick because the bear ran away, and she saved the pig. Uh, um, and <laughs> after that, hung the um, hung the handle, the broken handle of the frying pan, on on the wall. You know, it's a trophy. <laughs> and, and apparently her husband was the butt of jokes. <laughs> As they lived in the area, not too long after that, they moved up into yeah. Benton. <laughs> but um, I'm sure, I mean, that isn't that far away. <laughs> and um, and uh, when uh, Stafford Cleveland, who 
besides writing the, a really excellent history of Yates County, and the, uh, actually wrote it in, in the age, late 1860s, started to be published in 1873. Uh, he uh, included that story in the material that he collected for the history. Now, everything he collected didn't make it into the history itself. Um, but he, uh, but that was a story that he, he collected. He printed it in his newspaper um, and, uh, you know, for comment, I guess. And one of the other newspaper, you know, attacked it, attacked the story, thought it was really stupid and made up and, and all this. And so all these women, it was all women, apparently, who confirmed it, came out of the woodwork. Oh, yeah, I remember that happened, you know, when I was, I was about 12, 14, and uh, sure, we were talking about that, and I could, I remember seeing the frying pan handle. <laughs> um, and um, so I guess it happened. Uh, they were respectable women, and uh, apparently, uh, you know, would never make anything up. Although I, I still one of my favorite pen hand stories. I can just see that little woman out there with her yeah. <laughs> going after that mayor. She just wasn't going to lose all that pork. <laughs> and uh, so it, it really is one of my very favorite stories about pen hand. Um, you know, and there's stories about, you know, uh, people, Jeremiah Gillette shot a bear out in front of where, in Cleveland's day, um, uh, was the uh, Cornwall Opera House, and that was built in 1864. And uh, so that's what, where he says it took place, in, you know, in the street. Of course, that building is still standing, that is Long's Cards and Books. And um, it replaced, it replaced uh, the best hotel in Peng An, which it burned down in 1857. So there, for a while there was a vacant lot there, and it the built, actually there were several vacant lots because when the hotel burned down, it took most of that part of Main Street with it. Um, and uh, that was about the time that the village decided to um, not let people build wooden buildings in the center of the, of the village. In 1836, just a few years after the village was incorporated, there was a row of, of stores on the west side of Main Street, um, starting where the Reedman Building is now, and going up street towards Main Lane. There was a whole bunch of, of little, little stores there that had been built um, in the 1830s. Uh, 1820s and 30s, and they all burned down at once in 1836, which denuded the whole street because above that the land hadn't been subdivided yet. So um, there, and and you know everybody called it. Apparently, the nickname for these stores was Brimstone Row, and I always thought, well, that's sure because it burned down. But no, it was already burned Brimstone Row when it was up. And apparently, it was one of those, they, they were all saloons, and <laughs> et cetera. And um, <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and, um, and that's why it was Brimstone Row. You know, it was the haunt of the devil. And uh, so it deserved burning down, obviously. <laughs> and uh, the village was incorporated in 1833. And, and uh, Brimstone Row burned down in 1836, and very shortly after that, the village passed a, uh, it was a fire safety law, um, saying that within certain boundaries, which were delineated, um, you couldn't go to wooden mill. They, all the new stores after that needed to be made of brick. Some were brick already, but um, the interesting thing is that all, until 1840, when uh, 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 cast iron storefronts became uh, available. Before that, all brick building, brick stores were built on a timber frame. So they burned down like, like firewood anyway, because they, they, it, the brick was just a, a veneer. Okay, it didn't support, 
it didn't support itself, it was built against that timber frame, and that was the, what supported the building. Um, once it became possible to hold your building up with cast iron, obviously it, it was a lot better uh, in uh, several ways, <laughs> one of which was the whole thing that we burned down when it burned out. Um, in an era of open fires, open flames, uh, things burned down on a pretty regular basis. And uh, uh, of course, that doesn't mean they quit burning down when you know electricity was invented. And any of you who've lived here for a long time know that, uh, we all managed to burn down quite a little of Penn Yan, uh, even as late as the 50s and 60s. And, and every once in a while, still a house goes up in smoke. But um, my favorite, of course, is in 19, what was the one in, 19, in December, uh, around Christmas time, in 1967, when the firehouse burned down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, yes, that was, how many lived here and remember that? Yeah, yeah. Everybody that was within 50 miles of Penny Ann at, at, at that time remembers that fire burn. Um, you know, fire, um, because the, the village fire company couldn't fight it. Obviously, all their stuff was in this burning building. And unfortunately, all the fire company's historic records were in there too. So they lost all their, and, and judging from the parallel uh, discussions that show up in the village minutes, it was pretty hair-raised in the early history of all the fire companies. Uh, they were always going in and out of business and and, uh, and uh, uh, turf battles, you know, over um, over whose engine is supposed to answer this particular fire in a certain area of the village and so on. But by 1867, it was just the, what, there were two still two firehouses, but uh, I'm not sure that the one up on the north end of Main Street was still fighting fires. The building was still there. It was used by the ambulance corps when it was founded in '72, <coughs> um, and almost immediately thereafter it was torn down, <laughs> and they built the ambulance corps that's there now. Um, but uh, the the uh, the the firehouse fire actually it was not the first time that the firehouse had burned down. It had burned it to the ground, smoking ruins in the 1880s, 1888, and uh, it was built for the first time in 1856. And the, the two subsequent buildings on the spot were on the same footprint. They went back farther so they could put, they could jam more fire engines in it, although it's still a very, very small building. Um, it, when you look at photo, I've got photographs of it in, in, in the book, and you can see it. It was between two much larger store buildings, and it looks like this little midget. And you turn, and it turns out that this is the fire fire uh, firehouse, <laughs> um, and it had a it had a tall steel frame, like a tower on top of it, and um, like like. Uh, Loudspeakers, the horn, that air horn, I suppose, is what they were, up way up there on top of it, facing in all directions, very dramatic looking. <laughs> and uh, it was, of course, a volunteer company, just like it is today. Um, and just like it is today, the fire company was like um, an exclusive men's club. And uh, everyone, uh, in those days, they, really, they competed uh, against one another within the village, you know, in terms of, um, you know, who had the sharpest uniforms, who had the best band, and uh, who, who looked the best in the parade, and, uh, you know, who could do this and that with the, you know, pump more water than the other one, and all that kind of thing. Um, and the, uh, the newspaper very faithfully reports, you know, the results of these competitions. <laughs> and, um, and truly, it was the, it was the, uh, it wasn't just, you know, the people hanging around the corner. It was the elite of Penny Ann 
and it belonged to those fire companies. And the people who hung around on the corner. It was probably one of the very few places where social class didn't mean anything. Um, because it, it's pretty evident from reading uh, contemporary accounts of things that there was definitely an upper crust and a lower crust, which was mostly Irish. <laughs> <coughs> Not entirely, but largely. So, wait, going way back to the 1790s now, we, we remember the wolf, and remember Robert Chisholm's double log cabin. There was no Main Street. Uh, there were no mills at the foot of Main Street. There was apparently no bridge across the outlet at the foot of Main Street, which didn't exist. <laughs> and um, he was about a couple million miles from everywhere. He, if, if anybody was ever on a separate planet, it was Robert Chisholm and his, you know, uh, analogs in other parts of early settlements in western New York. It was true wilderness, untouched essentially by human hands. Um, there were, of course, Indians who lived here, but um, the, it was not heavily peopled uh, it, before white settlement began at all. Um, the Iroquois who were, who lived in, the Seneca actually were the Iroquois tribe who lived here and they had only one, as far as is known, only one settlement in Yates County at all and that was uh, at Kashan. Um, people turn up arrowheads and so on in their vineyards, and those are not Seneca. Those are uh, apparently, I'm such an expert on, on you know, projectile points, but uh, <laughs> they're apparently early woodland, which is like the people who were here before the Seneca. Maybe their ancestors, maybe not. I get, they are apparently still arguing about that. The Seneca's, uh, believe that they are autochthonous, that they were they came out of the earth here. But um, the uh, you know, anthropologists mostly think there were people, some people living around um, this area very, very from the time that the ice melted at the end of the glacial age, about 10,000 years. And the, that the Seneca's arrived in the maybe the 14th century, AD. Uh, <clears throat> they already had uh, iron uh, tools, which of course they didn't make themselves. They, uh, the, the trade networks provided those. Um, but, um, so there's, there's Robert Chisholm on his, on his island, um, which is the way I prefer to think of it, rather than as a separate planet, you know. And um, he, uh, in 1799, Main Street was laid out. Actually, it was laid out by, um, by Ontario County, which we belonged to at that time. And um, it does turn up in the local town record books uh, in Benton, and then in Milo as well. And the, the road that became Main Street started at Benton Center, where there were other roads that met it. Didn't just start, you know. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, there were a couple other roads in the county. And then um, that came due south from Benton Center, we're on 14A, in other words, due south, and then it went off at a slight angle um, to the uh, one of the corners of Robert Chisholm's property. Uh, the corner in question is at the intersect now at the intersection of Main Street and um, uh, uh, North Avenue. Okay. That, uh, that four corners, that was the original four corners of Penn Yan in every sense of the word because it was the first intersection <laughs> Ta -da! 
And it was also, um, that's where things, you know, the first commercial enterprises, the first settlers settled around in that neighborhood. Robert Chisholm did not sell his property, so nobody, it, it didn't start over where his cabin was. It, it started about 60 rods away where the two roads intersected. And uh, that road was extended probably by David Wagner, um, who is said to have laid out Main Street. It was not laid out by the town. Careful reading of the, of the road survey um, indicates that it stopped dead at that intersection. <laughs> it met uh, the Canandaigua Road, and that was that. But uh, by 1799, David Wagner had, had a mill at the foot of at where, where, not where Burkett Mills is, but across on the other side of the outlet, on the other bank. And uh, there was still no bridge across there. So everybody that went to his mill had to come from the south along either the Lake Road, which existed, or the Bath Road, which also existed uh, at that time. And those are both quite early roads. And um, so, it, so Main, that is Main Street. It was called Main Street pretty early. Um, uh, it was laid out, it must have been laid out in 1799 if it was laid out by David Wagner because that's the year he died. He died in August. But prior to that, he apparently um, took, uh, uh, took uh, uh, a, a line. <laughs> from where the road ended, up at the intersection, all the way down to his mill. There was apparently by that time, by that time in 1799, either he built or somebody built a bridge. Um, it is not mentioned in any record. There's no records of a Main Street bridge until 1805. But why build that road if you couldn't get across to the mill? There's nothing else down there. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that, that by 1799 it was in fact a bridge. Um, David Wagner was, uh, was a Pennsylvanian who came in um, to the county in, with the uh, Universal Friend. He arrived here in 1792 and his first uh, opened, actually the first public house in what is now Yates County. It was out by the Friends Mill, which is a site, a site now called Seneca Mill on the outlet, about halfway down to Dresden, where the big waterfall is. And um, there is, you can still see where the road uh, goes up on the south side of the outlet and kind of, kind of slants across that hillside and comes out at the top of, um, on the, 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 the uh, ridge road there right at the top, um, across from a farm which at the time was owned by James Lee. And so a number of people lived, you know, famous locally. <laughs> um, they're big frogs in a small pond <laughs> along that road. And, um, and, and that was part of the very first road, actually, that was built in Yates County. That was built way back in 1789 to get to the Friends Mill uh, from, from the Friends Settlement, which was at City Hill, <coughs> still at that time, way over by Seneca Lake. So um, the, you, what you had in Penyan, which didn't have that name yet. I'm going to have to smash and finish with the, with the name Mamie. Uh, <laughs> what, what you had was a small settlement comprising three taverns on uh, three of the four corners of the, uh, 
Benyon was a hotbed in those days. <laughs> it was really regarded, you know, out of the sides of their eyes by the by the everybody else, you know, who lived around. Um, you know, they weren't angels either. <laughs> so I mean, for Penny Ann to have been regarded as, you know, the flesh pots is is means something. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this little settlement up around the, the four corners, the old four corners, and there's this little settlement down at the bottom of Main Street um, around the mill. And um, they're about a mile between them. Main Street is just about a mile long, almost, just a little less than a mile. And um, they were really two, I mean, they were a mile apart. It was two different settlements. Um, and uh, as, as I uh, talk about, and I think it's the first chapter <laughs> of that book, the history of the village is largely the history of how that gap was, was bridged. It, uh, it you know, filled in pretty gradually. Um, the last stores uh, up around Maiden Lane weren't built until the 1850s. Um, so I mean, it took a long time. Uh, for, there were businesses up around the Four Corners. There were businesses, but fewer of them down around the mills. And they kind of regarded themselves apparently as um, uh, the uh, the Mills Wagner's uh, the Wagner family were Pennsylvanians, so that was um, regarded as the Pennsylvania end of town. Now the funny part <coughs> is that the other end was uh, almost named Morrisville um, after uh, Morris F. Shepard, who was a cousin of the Wagners, and he was from Pennsylvania, but. In any case, they, it was really regarded by most of the people around as that was the New England end of town. Uh, Penny Ann, like Yates County, was settled primarily by people from Pennsylvania and Yankees from New England. So uh, sometime in probably 1805, and 1805 is probably when this took place, because it, the name appears on a public record in January of 1806. I discovered. <laughs> I'm sure nobody's read the record of roads <laughs> in, 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 you know, like at least decades. And, you know, they weren't looking for how, when did the name first appear. But I was. <laughs> So anyways, um, sometime in, towards the end of 1805, presumably, uh, it was felt, why, I, I'm not sure, but it was felt by the people in the two settlements that they ought to have one name. <laughs> and um, they couldn't, of course, agree on, on a name. Um, the farmers around about, around about um, called it pandemonium. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, which is really hilarious because in, in 1808, between Penny Ann and um, uh, you take Flat Street North and where it ends there at Haven's Corners Road, mm -hmm. where it really ends, you know, and then, I mean, I'm not counting the other part of it. <laughs> there were eight distilleries. Because <laughs> they were taxed, you see, so we know that. <laughs> Eight of them. Now, you know, there's an explanation for that. Now, they, you know, they, they didn't think they were wild and crazy. It was just that they were so isolated, they couldn't ship grain. Um, it was just, they really, the cash crops were a big deal because, you know, you had to pay your taxes in cash. <laughs> if nothing else, you still you had to pay your taxes with actual money. And so um, because grain, the grain that they that everybody knew couldn't couldn't be shipped because they were the roads you couldn't ship it, okay? 
Uh, there were no canals, no railroads. All they had was these crummy roads. So what they did was they distilled them. <laughs> and you know, it takes a lot of grain to make, you know, to make a jug. And so um, that was much easier to take to to uh, Utica or um, Albany or wherever and, uh, and get some cash money for it. And so the primarily, uh, it, the very first cash crop in Yates County, the very first one, wasn't, oddly enough, whiskey. It was ashes because you had to, to farm your land, you had to clear the trees off. And the way that you did that was you girdled them to kill them and then you burned them down because we're talking a tree like this, okay? Lots of them. <laughs> so, and so there was just no other way to get rid of them. Um, and so uh, the ashes not only fertilized the soil, it was known that they were very rich in phosphorus and they did they were good fertilizer for a while. But they were also um, capable of being rendered down into potash. And again, that was the, that was the first cash crop. As they were burning down all the trees in Yates County. And if you've ever studied 19th century photographs of the county, you will see, you know, now we're used to seeing woods again. But it's hard to recognize a lot of the terrain because it is absolutely bare. There are no trees. They were all. Uh, either burned down or cut down. Um, and so, and then when they finished that, they all went to Michigan and did it again. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> it was just a, you know. Um, but the um, second cash crop <laughs> was whiskey. <laughs> and until the 1830s, when the canal was built, you basically uh, either had to consume what you grew here or sold it, you know, you sold it maybe around the lake or, uh, but you couldn't get out of the, of the Cuca Lake watershed. Now, if you were on the Seneca Lake side, you could, because the Erie Canal was completed in 1825, and you could get to it from Seneca Lake. But Cuca Lake was perched up on top 700 feet higher, and you just couldn't go anywhere except in its own watershed. <clears throat> And uh, when the canal was built in 1833, all of a sudden you could sell your stuff all essentially all over the world if you cared to, but you could certainly sell it um, in in cities in, in elsewhere in New York, and uh, which is what happened. All of a sudden, uh, it was just like it, the the change. If you study the agricultural patterns, was profound. Just absolutely profound. And of course, it really changed, um, like all profound agricultural changes, it also changed the, uh, the, the basically the whole culture of the little settlements that depended on the local agriculture, including Ben Yan, which is why I spent a lot of time um, discussing things like the canal, railroad, and, and so on, primarily because of their effect on agriculture. Uh, but you can also get to Canada a lot easier, too, <laughs> if you cared to. Uh, by 1823, you didn't have to go to, go to Canada, but you only had to go to Penny Ann. And um, it was very intelligently sighted right in the middle of the new county so that it wasn't a really long trip for anybody. Um, that was just a coincidence. <laughs> so the guy, basically, the guys that wanted the county formed all came from Ben Ann. Um, and um, when it was approved uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the state legislature, one of whose members was Aaron Reamer, who lived in Ben Ann, um, he, you know, slid it through the, legis the state legislature, and then a delegation, and they were all Penyaners, took the, you know, the piece of paper and brought it to, by hand to the governor, and um, and promised to name the county after. <laughs> that's how Yates County got its name, because that's the guy who signed this 
it was a kind of a bribe <laughs> to get this to get the governor to sign the bill. And uh, he did. <laughs> and so uh, and that's essentially why Penny Ann was the county became the county seat. Um, but um, <laughs> it still doesn't have a name yet. <laughs> what what so anyway, there was, a, there was basically a fight about the name of the place. And there were a number, there was Morrisville, that was pumped by the people at the north end of Main Street, and um, Unionville, and, and uh, a, couple of, a couple of other um, uh, names, proposed names. Morrisville actually finds its way onto the Eats. Uh, but then they found out they couldn't, they couldn't have a Morris bill because there was another one already. <laughs> Darn. And so, <laughs> so, they, uh, so that went by the wayside. But in any case, apparently it took them a long time, a long discussion, and everybody was very dry, um, except there was a jug available. And um, it was passed freely among everybody. And a man, a local man, like local store, storekeeper named Philemon Baldwin, whose claim to fame locally, besides the fact that he made one of the towers uh, in a store, um, was that he was a, a terrible punster. And he really liked word games and, and, and so on. He was a really, real, you know, one of those people that you kind of avoid. And he really he just, just loved making, you know, playing tricks with words. And he proposed that because the crowd uh, was composed almost entirely of Pennamites, i.e. Pennsylvanians, and Yankees, New Englanders, why don't we call it Penn Yang? And that's what it was called for several years <laughs> until another storekeeper, who was a Scot by birth, oddly enough, called James Greaves, decided uh, or promoted taking off the G from Yang because it really didn't sound that great. But apparently everybody loved it, um, you know, for close to 10 years because uh, it, it was Pen Yang all, in all, every, all the records. It's obviously how it was pronounced. And, uh, but, you know, starting in about the middle of the second decade there, the teens decade of the 19th century, it was Pen Yan. <laughs> it's not Chinese, okay? If anybody ever asks you, it is not Chinese. However, it is unique. There is no other Pen Yan in the world. <laughs> there is no other Yates County in the world. That's your fact for the day. Um, oddly enough, there, nobody ever named a county in the United States or anywhere else after a person named Yates. And there was a big family in New York politics, but apparently there weren't any anywhere else. <laughs> so, so you get your one Yates County and that fills up the board. <clears throat> so that's how Penyon's name got that way. And I hope, since you were interested enough, to come and hear me, you know, go on and on about things, that um, you will also be interested enough to buy and, more important, read my book. Um, it is uh, apparently selling like hotcakes. <laughs> um, and um, we keep running out of it, but um, uh, there, are, there are some available now. So strike while the iron is hot if you haven't already. And I will be glad right now to answer any questions that were tried to answer. That's not be too arrogant uh, that you might have. Yes. Mr. Thomas, uh, what was the actual date that Penny Ann was uh, made Penny Ann? When the name, it, it must have been before December 6, 1806. How come there's no sign out there that says established 1806? Well, that's a good question. And nobody <laughs> else knows it <laughs> until I read my book. Um, the um, village itself, and the first post office in, in Penny Ann was called Jerusalem. Okay, that was established in 1800. There was a post office in Abraham Wagner's house, uh, and it was called Jerusalem. 
And at some point, which I have not yet, I mean, I, there are ways to discover when post offices were named. And, um, but I, ha I haven't done that. <laughs> I just, you know, I ran, yeah. basically ran out of energy and time at the same time. And so I had, I don't know when the post office was changed to Penny Ann, but it was probably after, let's say, 1815. But it, apparently it was before 1820. And um, so as far as the official, official name, yeah. uh, that's your approximate date. And it, it ought to be discoverable what the exact mm -hmm. date is. But um, as far as the party under the pine tree at the foot of Main Street with the jug, um, uh, it, um, it isn't known, or at least it wasn't, isn't known by me. Um, and and it, the, there have been different dates floated, and I've never before seen 1805. Mm -hmm. um, so um, there it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It was, by the way, the big pine tree that reminded me. There were two great big pine trees along Main Street. Now, you have to remember that Penny Ann, when Abraham Wagner inherited it in 1799, it was, it was swampy. You know, we're at the head of one, or actually the foot, of one of, of, one of the finger lakes, and they're all swampy at the top and at the bottom. <laughs> And uh, it had apparently enough dry land, so there was like pine scrub. Um, so I guess it was probably like the pine barrens in New Jersey or near Albany, that sort of rather sandy soil and, and just scrubby little pine bushes. <laughs> but there were two great big pine trees. One was way up uh, near North Avenue. Uh, on, uh, they were both on the west side of the street. The second one was uh, right on the brink of the outlet. And the kicker to that story is that it would later on, a few years later, Amasa Tool named his grocery store the Pine Tree Grocery. And that was at 102 Main Street, which is the Reedman building now. 100, it's got two numbers. 100, 102. That was the foot of Main Street at that time. Um, and it, apparently, the, the, uh, the outlet and the canal when it was built were down in, the, in a, you know, a shallow ravine about 20 feet deep. And the bank was just a little bit south of Elm Street. And, uh, you know, so everything between, let's say, the, the, the intersection there and uh, where it now drops off, uh, that was all, that's all fill. Hmm. Someday somebody ought to do an archaeological dig and find out what it, what's in there. Back to Clinton Street. Would that have gone through the museum? But Albert House now or going through the church? We're no, what if Chapel Street, I right, can visualize now. Chapel first? Street was laid out in 1824. Okay. And there are maps. When the when the when Penn Yen was made the county seat, it wasn't incorporated yet, but they made maps because they had to delineate what they called the jail liberties. And there is, it is shown, Chapel Street is shown in 1824 as going, all, going straight east, okay? But by the time Clinton Street was laid out in 1835, they couldn't do that because there was a build. So, there because there was this chair factory in, right. in the way. Right yeah, right on the corner where the church is, uh, where St. Mark's Church is now. Was the Oliver House there then? 18? No, 1852 is when it was built. 1852. Yeah, there was a building there. Um, it was a tavern. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Just like everything. Uh, yeah, well, there are a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, there were even disorderly houses. There were, it was, um, 
um, illegal to have a disorderly house, <laughs> um, or to allow allow uh, your building to be used as such. Uh, there's a big long paragraph with you know a bunch of synonyms, but it, 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 that's basically no brothels allowed. But um, there were plenty of them because a lot of people, women of course, also went to jail for it. And we have the jail record. I saw another name. Yes. I love your storytelling, and I was wondering if you had another funny story for us. Oh, a funny story. <laughs> um, now I'll go after right you blank, you understand. Let's see. You know, horse thieves, or I don't know. Yeah. You know, there was a there was a uh, like a vigilance committee that took care of fourth stage. They all got together. It was actually a, a to prevent a cast of cattle and sheep rustling. Um, I don't know if that's not a funny story, but I, it's interesting. It so was that had a posse? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, I mean, it must have been illegal. There, was, there were certainly laws against rustling, but it wasn't very well enforced except by the locals. There wasn't a lot of it going on. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> Apparently. Um, I mean, and that is to say, I, there are very few, very few cases of um, livestock wrestling that come up in the courts. Um, I can't offhand you know, think of any, but I'm sure there were some. But obviously, it wasn't a you know a local big, big local industry. Um, it was uh, the biggest. You know, there the were a lot of sheep in those days, and the big problem was that they are so vulnerable to attack from my animals, and uh, which is why almost everybody's giving it up, and, you know, now, but then they, they tried to break through their sheep and, and apparently succeeded, but they must have had dogs or the, their kids or somebody. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got. I know there was a there was a good story that involved a bear, uh, but it actually didn't take place in Penn Yan. Oh, that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> um, there were again bears were notoriously stealing everybody's pigs, and um, <laughs> and also apparently, just as they do now, they they as the land was cleared. Uh, deer became common. There were basically no deer here until the farm, you know, people came and started clearing land. But they grew corn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the deer love corn, I can tell you that from personal experience. And so um, uh, this, it was um, uh, one of the Shermans that lived in Sherman Hollow Road, I think, was it Bartleson Sherman? Maybe not. I think it was his father, Ezekiel, Ezekiel Sherman. And um, so he uh, decided, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, to because they came at night, he built a, like a high platform um, in the middle of his cornfield. And he'd sit up there at night with his gun, you know, and, and, and blow the heads off. And it appeared that <laughs> was stupid enough to show up, um, except of course, that was in his dreams because with him there, nobody came to eat his corn. And then, so after a while, he kind of got careless and, and he started, he'd sleep up there, okay? Figuring that if anything important happened, he'd wake up. And um, one night, one night, the thing is going like this, you know, on his platform. What, what, what's going on? It's absolutely dark. Okay, because you know, obviously no street lights are made. I mean, there aren't any now in Sherman's Hollow. <laughs> there certainly were any there then. And um, so he, you know, he doesn't have a light. All he's got is his wonder bus. And he, you know, I don't know where he, all I can see is that there's something big rubbing on one of the posts. <laughs> <laughs> Must be, you know, if I figure out, it must be probably a bear. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> and um, he was kind of hoping it wouldn't cave in, 
Yeah. But, and it did. <laughs> <laughs> the bear knocked the whole caboose down on himself, mm. and in, including Ezekiel Sherman, <laughs> and um, uh, who was the, to all you know everybody concerned was buried in the wreckage of this pla platform. Well, he 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 got up. He had lost his gun in the fog and just basically took off 30 miles an hour to get back in his house, which luckily wasn't very far away. And he, you know, his, his, uh, he let his dogs loose, and they raised all kinds of uh, cane, you know, barking at the, dog, at the bear and so on. I guess the bear, from what I'm remembering now, the bear actually grabbed one of them and killed it. But the other one survived, and between, you know, with all that, the bear, obviously, you know, it was a couple of years of corn. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, you got a place to scratch, That's right? right. <laughs> and so he, he beat feet and, and got out of there, and, and basically all the human beings involved at least lived to tell the tale. But it just, uh, it just uh, goes to show. Uh, you know, I mean, apparently he dined out on his story for years. But it probably wasn't all that funny at the time. I'm uh, sure. You know, yeah. his wife was probably screaming in the house and all his thousands of children. And, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, so, uh, but it didn't, it had a happy ending, except even for the bear, because, you know, yeah. he didn't get shot. That's right. I don't know if he got his corn, though. Um, well, he probably got the corn before the itch. Maybe, yeah. Let's, let's. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, he got his corn, he got his pig, <laughs> but he got out of there. Yeah, yeah. he passed up the pig. Uh, yeah. He wasn't after the pig, he decided he was after the corn. <laughs> What's well, really sweet, you know. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. The, my horses used to love the stalks. Because they are, they've got a lot of sugar in them. They're closely related to sugar cane. And bears have a sweet tooth, too, as you know. Pork. That's probably why they like pig so much. Because it, it is kind of sweet. You had your hand up there. Okay. <laughs> is that uh, old cemetery down there near Dresden have any bearing on Penny Ann? What you Wait, now, which about? cemetery down near Dresden are we talking about? Down there, uh, right off the outlet trail. The Hopeton uh, Cemetery. The Hopeton. Well, that settlement um, was, um, it was a, a the settlement was up on top, okay? Yeah. It wasn't down in the ravine of the outlet. That's where the mills for the village were. And the, the village itself was up, you know, where uh, the triangle is now, yeah. 14, where you can go yeah. kind of two ways there. That is approximately where the so-called lost village of Houghton mm -hmm. was. And it was founded in about 1795 by Charles Williamson, who was uh, the... Uh, the fellow who uh, was the agent for the pulping state, you know, he, he sold a lot of land in the city. Most of the deeds, if you work them back far enough, will start with Charles Williamson. Even though he didn't own the land himself, he worked for the people who did. And um, there were mills at Geneva, and there were mills at Bath, both of which he was involved with. Okay, and he. He was a um, he. His task for the Pulte estate was to develop the land, so more settlers would come. But he spent so much money building bridges and mills and roads and all this stuff that the, the, they fired him because he wasn't, you know, the, the, they wasn't selling fast enough. Uh, the land wasn't being sold fast enough, even though people were coming in. Yeah. He was. You know, he was just spending a fortune on improvements. But he built, he wanted about halfway between, he felt that would be a good place for a, for a, a merchant mill. Now, the, the interesting thing about that mill is that it was, um, it served kind of as a bank, it was what they call a merchant mill. And so you, you, say you, you owed money to him, okay? <laughs> you would take your, your wheat or whatever, you know, your grain crop to that mill and um, thereby pay your debt to him. That way it would be ground into flour and so on and now it belongs to him. And, and the book, the ledger, uh, beginning in 1801, 
exists for that. For that, uh, it was belonged to uh, a man named George Gowdry, who had done similar work. He was a millwright. He built and helped build, build the mill, and he uh, he uh, ran it for quite a long time. And so the, the records for and so. 1801, you know, I mean, that's like the first dozen people who lived in the county. So <laughs> it's it's really a very interesting document uh, in that um, it, it tells you who was doing it, who was who was borrowing money, and who was loaning it, and, and, and you know, you can you can derive a lot of very interesting information from it. Um, and uh, it's been scanned, and it's been indexed. And the problem is that the names are outlandishly spelled. And so the person that was helping me basically, A, couldn't read it, and B, when she finally worked out what the letters were, it didn't make any a, a name that she recognized. So um, I told her, you know, just just write down what it's at, what it looks like to you, and I'll take care of it. So I haven't taken care of it yet, but one of these days I will. <laughs> and because I had all the fun of reading it, you see, so I would not. <laughs> but uh, it ought to be out there where other people can uh, access that information. So very interesting. But no, it doesn't have too much other than that. And other than um, people who lived in Kenyan made use of that mill for that purpose. Okay, they didn't. They probably, for their own bread flour, went down the street to David Wagner's mill, but to you know pay pay their debts. And yeah, no money, no cash money, and it, so that's what you had was yeah. wheat or corn or barley or rye or whatever. Um, that's how you how you pay. Your dad. So I know Robert Chisholm was there several times, um, uh, uh, paying, paying, uh, you know, uh, other people that I recognize. So there were people that lived in Penya that made use of it as a as a kind of bank. Um, but um, other than that, I mean, it didn't have a lot of direct impact. No, it's too early, really. Penya got its mill, its first grist mill. In 1796. So before that, of course, anybody who lived there had to go someplace else. Thank you. Sure. Yes. How big a year was 1833 in terms of uh, construction of? Oh, big. Big. Oil? Because that was the year the canal was open for navigation. That's basically why Penyan was incorporated in that year. Um, it had grown enough in population to that they felt they ought to they incorporate and be, be grown up and be a village. And so that's what happened. But that was the, you know, that's, it was due to the canal. And you can see um, the, the uh, canal was surveyed by Holmes Hutchinson, the engineer who built it, supervised building it, um, in 1828. But he finished the map and filed it in Albany, because you know the state owned the canal, just like it owned the rest of the Erie system. He didn't do that until 1834. So he, when he was finishing that map <coughs> of the canal, what he did was he put in the roads and the buildings as of 1834, not just 1828. And so I, I, until I learned that, I know this wasn't here in 1828, and you know I know this wasn't here, <laughs> and so on until then. But then I found out that well, for example, the Yates County Bank, which wasn't built until 1833, and see that's it's obviously a very significant event, the first bank. Right. That happened in 1833. It's shown on that map, and I was I was just. She's maybe they were talking about it. I, you know, I couldn't figure it out until I learned that the map was filed, completed and filed in 1834. So, and there's a lot of other buildings that I knew were built in 1828 uh, until I solved my confusion by figuring out the right date or learning about the right date. Mm -hmm. um, but that sh that shows that there were a, there was a 
big building boom, you know, recently, <laughs> just before that map was filed. Um, and it's true. And there was no, in 1836, Abraham Wagner finally, finally, after years of, of digging his heels in, started to sell off the property that he owned in Penn Yant. He was already out on the bluff in 1836, but he just didn't want to sell anything. He still owned the mills, he still owned all the, the commercial blocks up to about where Maiden Lane is. Um, and um, he just didn't want to sell it. But they finally, you know, John Sloan and a bunch of, bunch of other people got together and, uh, and paid him uh, $25,000. For, yeah, which is, I mean, at least 15 times that today. At least, I mean, that's minimal. I mean, it's hard to, because not only inflation comes into play, but um, and it was a, just a tremendous sum that he held out for, which is just like it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, don't get me started on saying, Graham Wagner will all be doomed, don't say. <laughs> but, um, you're correct in that a lot of the businesses up by, that were up uh, on North Avenue started moving downtown in the early 1830s. Because, uh, of course, everybody knew there was going to be a canal in a year or two, you see. And so, at the beginning, the land started being sold off, and then the big chunk in 1836. And so, that there, all of a sudden, all this uh, commercial development was taking place at the foot of Main Street. It, it must have been a very exciting time. Oh, <laughs> and they knew the canal was going to do that. You know, they had a big parade when it was when it was finished and hauled a hand carry, you know, a, a canal boat through the streets. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's quite a, quite a big deal. Uh, but wouldn't you know it? The newspapers uh, went out of went out of business. Uh, the Republican newspaper went out of business. In early 1833, before the canal was finished, so none of that is covered in it, mm -hmm. and it, the other paper doesn't exist for that particular. You know, it wasn't just carefully kept up because it ceased publication in the 1940s. So, there's no real archive of the other newspaper. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So, when you were a little kid, did you always want to know the history of everything? Yeah, but not here. I didn't live here. So, uh, how early on did you realize that, that doing something like this is what you love? Oh, I don't know. I was probably five or six. <laughs> <laughs> I've been interested, very interested in history for a very long time. My dad is kind of a military history buff, so I caught that. And then, and then uh, interestingly enough, the, reason, the thing that got me into uh, local history Still was here was uh, genealogy. You know, I'm not just a date collector. I like to know what was going on, what made him do that for him and say that kind of thing. And, and so that that's a very direct influence. Yeah. And then, uh, but I have no genealogy. You know, not nobody here. Uh, I didn't move here until uh, 1974. I was 28. <laughs> One of those days, I don't know. <laughs> 28 years old. What a great age. <laughs> the inner frame is still about that. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're so glad that you decided to come here. Well, thank you. I am too. I know. <laughs>